Essay number seven of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Essay seven. Considerations by the way. Hear what British Merlin sung, of keenest eye and truest tongue say not the chiefs who first arrive usurp the seats for which all strive the forefathers this land who found failed to plant the vantage ground ever from one who comes to-morrow men wait their good and truth to borrow but wilt thou measure all thy road see thou lift the lightest load who has little to him who has less can spare and thou sindolent son beware ponderous gold and stuffs to bear to falter ere thou task fulfil only the light-armed climbed the hill the richest of all lords is youth and ruddy health the loftiest muse live in the sunshine swim the sea drink the wild air's salubrity where the star canopy shines in may shepherds are thankful and nations gay the music that can deepest reach and cure all ill is cordial speech mask thy wisdom with the light toy with the bow yet hit the white of all wit's uses the main one is to live well with who has none cleave to thine acre the round year will fetch all fruits and virtues here fool and foe may harmless roam loved and lovers bide at home a day for toil an hour for sport but for a friend is life too short considerations by the way although this garrulity of advising is born with us i confess that life is rather a subject of wonder than of didactics so much fate so much irresistible dictation from temperament and unknown inspiration enters into it that we doubt we can say anything out of our own experience whereby to help each other all the professions are timid and expectant agencies the priest is glad if his prayers or a sermon meet the condition of any soul if of two, if of ten, tis a signal success. But he walked to the church without any assurance that he knew the distemper or could heal it. The physician prescribes hesitatingly, out of his few resources, the same tonic or sedative to this new and peculiar constitution which he has applied with various success to a hundred men before. If the patient mends, he is glad and surprised. The lawyer advises the client, and tells his story to the jury, and leaves it with them, and is as gay and as much relieved as the client if it turns out that he has a verdict. The judge weighs the arguments, and puts a brave face on the matter, and, since there must be a decision, decides as he can, and hopes he has done justice, and given satisfaction to the community, but is only an advocate, after all. And so is all life a timid and unskilful spectator we do what we must and call it by the best names we like very well to be praised for our action but our conscience says not unto us there's little we can do for each other we accompany the youth with sympathy and manifold old sayings of the wise to the gate of the arena but tis certain that not by strength of ours or of the old sayings but only on strength of his own unknown to us or to any he must stand or fall. That by which a man conquers in any passage is a profound secret to every other being in the world, and it is only as he turns his back on us and on all man, and draws on this most private wisdom, that any good can come to him. What we have, therefore, to say of life is rather description, or, if you please, celebration, than available rules. Yet vigour is contagious and whatever makes us either think or feel strongly adds to our power and enlarges our field of action we have a debt to every great heart to every fine genius to those who have put life and fortune on the cast of an act of justice to those who have added new sciences to those who have refined life by elegant pursuits it is the fine souls who serve us and not what is called fine society fine society is only a self-protection against the vulgarities of the street and the tavern fine society in the common acceptation has neither ideas nor aims 
it renders the service of perfumery or a laundry not of a farm or factory tis an exclusion and a precinct sydney smith said quote, a few yards in london cement or dissolve friendship end quote. it is an unprincipled decorum an affair of clean linen and coaches of gloves cards and elegance in trifles there are other measures of self-respect for a man than the number of clean shirts he puts on every day society wishes to be amused i do not wish to be amused i wish that life should not be cheap but sacred i wish the days to be as centuries loaded fragrant now we reckon them as bank days by some debt which is to be paid us or which we are to pay or some pleasure we are to taste is all we have to do to draw the breath in and blow it out again porphyry's definition is better quote, life is that which holds matter together End quote. the babe in arms is a channel through which the energies we call fate love and reason visibly stream see what a cometary train of auxiliaries man carries with him of animals plants stones gases and imponderable elements let us infer his ends from this pomp of means mirabeau said quote, why should we feel ourselves to be men unless it be to succeed in everything everywhere you must say of nothing that is beneath me nor feel that anything can be out of your power nothing is impossible to the man who can will is that necessary that shall be this is the only law of success End quote. whoever said it this is in the right key but this is not the tone and genius of the man in the street in the streets we grow cynical the men we meet are coarse and torpid the finest wits have their sediment what quantities of fribbles paupers invalids epicures antiquaries politicians thieves and triflers of both sexes might be advantageously spared mankind divides itself into two classes benefactors and malefactors the second class is vast the first a handful a person seldom falls sick but the bystanders are animated with a faint hope that he will die quantities of poor lives of distressing invalids of cases for a gun franklin said quote, mankind are very superficial and dastardly they begin upon a thing but meeting with a difficulty they fly from it discouraged but they have capacities if they would employ them End quote. shall we then judge a country by the majority or by the minority by the minority surely tis pedantry to estimate nations by the census or by square miles of land or other than by their importance to the mind of the time leave this hypocritical prating about the masses masses are rude lame unmade pernicious in their demands and influence and need not to be flattered but to be schooled i wish not to concede anything to them but to tame drill divide and break them up and draw individuals out of them the worst of charity is that the lives you are asked to preserve are not worth preserving masses the calamity is the masses i do not wish any mass at all but honest men only lovely sweet accomplished women only and no shovel-handed narrow-brained gin-drinking million stockingers or lazzaroni at all if government knew how i should like to see it check not multiply the population when it reaches its true law of action every man that is born will be hailed as essential away with this hurrah of masses and let us have the considerate vote of single men spoken on their honour and their conscience in old egypt it was established law that the vote of a prophet be reckoned equal to a hundred hands i think it was much underestimated clay and clay differ in dignity as we discover by our preferences every day what a vicious practice is this of our politicians at washington pairing off as if one man who votes wrong going away could excuse you who mean to vote right for going away or as if your presence did not tell in more ways than in your vote 
Suppose the three hundred heroes at Thermopylae had paired off with three hundred Persians. Would it have been all the same to Greece and to history? Napoleon was called by his men Saint Mille. Add honesty to him, and they might have called him Hundred Million. Nature makes fifty poor melons for one that is good, and shakes down a tree full of gnarled, wormy, unripe crabs before you can find a dozen dessert apples and she scatters nations of naked indians and nations of clothed christians with two or three good heads among them nature works very hard and only hits the white once in a million throws in mankind she is contented if she yields one master in a century the more difficulty there is in creating good men the more they are used when they come i once counted in a little neighbourhood and found that every able-bodied man had say from twelve to fifteen persons dependent on him for material aid, to whom he is to be for spoon and jug, for backer and sponsor, for nursery and hospital, and many functions beside. Nor does it seem to make much difference whether he is bachelor or patriarch. If he do not violently decline the duties that fall to him, this amount of helpfulness will in one way or another be brought home to him. This is the tax which his abilities pay." The good men are employed for private centres of use and for larger influence. All revelations, whether of mechanical or intellectual or moral science, are made not to communities but to single persons. All the marked events of our day, all the cities, all the colonizations, may be traced back to their origin in a private brain. All the feats which make our civility were the thoughts of a few good heads. Meantime, this spawning productivity is not noxious or needless. You would say, this rabble of nations might be spared. But no, they are all counted and depended on. Fate keeps everything alive so long as the smallest thread of public necessity holds it on to the tree. The coxcomb and bully and thief class are allowed as proletaries, every one of their vices being the excess or accredity of a virtue. The mass are animal in pupillage, and near chimpanzee, but the units whereof this mass is composed are neuters, every one of which may be grown to a queen bee. The rule is, we are used as brood atoms, until we think, then we use all the rest. Nature turns all malfeasance to good. Nature provided for real needs. No sane man at last distrusts himself. His existence is a perfect answer to all sentimental cavils. If he is, he is wanted, and has the precise properties that are required. That we are here is proof we ought to be here. We have as good right, and the same sort of right, to be here, as Cape Cod or Sandy Hook have to be there. To say, then, the majority are wicked, means no malice, no bad heart in the observer, but simply that the majority are unripe, and have not yet come to themselves, do not yet know their opinion. That, if they knew it, is an oracle for them and for all. But in the passing moment the quadruped interest is very prone to prevail, and this beast force, whilst it makes the discipline of the world, the school of heroes, the glory of martyrs, has provoked, in every age, the satire of wits and the tears of good men. They find the journals, the clubs, the governments, the churches, to be in the interest and the pay of the devil. And wise men have met this obstruction in their times, like Socrates, with his famous irony, like Bacon, with lifelong dissimulation, like Erasmus, with its the praise of folly, like Rabelais, with his satire rending the nations. Quote, they were the fools who cried against me, you will say, end quote wrote the Chevalier de Boufflet to Grimm. Quote, Aye, but the fools have the advantage of numbers, and tis that which decides. Tis of no use for us to make war with them. We shall not weaken them. They will always be the masters. There will not be a practice or a usage introduced of which they are not the authors. End quote. In front of these sinister facts, the first lesson of history is the good of evil. Good is a good doctor, but bad is sometimes a better. 
tis the oppressions of william the norman savage forest laws and crushing despotism that made possible the inspirations of magna carta under john edward i wanted money armies castles and as much as he could get it was necessary to call the people together by shorter swifter ways and the house of commons arose to obtain subsidies he paid in privileges in the twenty-fourth year of his reign he decreed quote, that no tax should be levied without consent of lords and commons end quote, which is the basis of the english constitution plutarch affirms that the cruel wars which followed the march of alexander introduced the civility language and arts of greece into the savage east introduced marriage built seventy cities and united hostile nations under one government the barbarians who broke up the roman empire did not arrive a day too soon schiller says the thirty years war made germany a nation rough selfish despots serve men immensely as henry the eighth in the contest with the pope as the infatuations no less than the wisdom of cromwell as the ferocity of the russian tsars as the fanaticism of the french regicides of seventeen eighty nine the frost which kills the harvest of a year saves the harvests of a century by destroying the weevil or the locust wars fires plagues break up immovable routine clear the ground of rotten races and dens of distemper and open a fair field to new men there is a tendency in things to right themselves and the war or revolution or bankruptcy that shatters a rotten system allows things to take a new and natural order the sharpest evils are bent into that periodicity which makes the errors of planets and the fevers and distempers of men self-limiting nature is upheld by antagonism passions resistance danger are educators we acquire the strength we have overcome without war no soldier without enemies no hero the sun were insipid if the universe were not opaque and the glory of character is in affronting the horrors of depravity to draw thence new nobilities of power as art lives and thrills in new use and combining of contrasts and mining into the dark evermore for blacker pits of night what would painter do or what would poet or saint but for crucifixions and hells and evermore in the world is this marvellous balance of beauty and disgust magnificence and rats no antoninus but a poor washerwoman said quote, the more trouble the more lion that's my principle end quote. i do not think very respectfully of the designs or the doings of the people who went to california in eighteen forty nine it was a rush and a scramble of needy adventurers and in the western country a general jail delivery of all the rowdies of the rivers some of them went with honest purposes some with very bad ones and all of them with the very commonplace wish to find a short way to wealth but nature watches over all and turns this malfeasance to good california gets peopled and subdued civilized in this immoral way and on this fiction a real prosperity is rooted and grown tis a decoy duck tis tubs thrown to amuse the whale but real ducks and whales that yield oil are caught and out of sabine rapes and out of robbers forays real romes and their heroisms come in fullness of time in america the geography is sublime but the men are not the inventions are excellent but the inventors one is sometimes ashamed of the agencies by which events so grand as the opening of california of texas of oregon and the junction of the two oceans are affected are paltry coarse selfishness fraud and conspiracy and most of the great results of history are brought about by discreditable means the benefaction derived in illinois and the great west from railroads is inestimable and vastly exceeding any intentional philanthropy on record what is the benefit done by a good king alfred or by a howard or pestalozzi or elizabeth fry or florence nightingale 
or any lover less or larger compared with the involuntary blessing wrought on nations by the selfish capitalists who build the illinois michigan and the network of the mississippi valley roads which have evoked not only all the wealth of the soil but the energy of millions of men tis a sentence of ancient wisdom quote, that god hangs the greatest weights on the smallest wires end quote. what happens thus to nations befalls every day in private houses when the friends of a gentleman brought to his notice the follies of his sons with many hints of their danger he replied that he knew so much mischief when he was a boy and had turned out on the whole so successfully that he was not alarmed by the dissipation of boys it was dangerous water but he thought they would soon touch bottom and then swim to the top this is bold practice and there are many failures to a good escape yet one would say that a good understanding would suffice as well as moral sensibility to keep one erect the gratifications of the passions are so quickly seen to be damaging and what men like least seriously lowering them in social rank then all talent sinks with character quote, croyez moi l'erreur aussi a son mérite end quote, said voltaire we see those who surmount by dint of some egotism or infatuation obstacles from which the prudent recoil the right partisan is a heady narrow man who because he does not see many things sees some one thing with heat and exaggeration and if he falls among other narrow men or on objects which have a brief importance as some trade or politics of the hour he prefers it to the universe and seems inspired and a godsend to those who wish to magnify the matter and carry a point better certainly if we could secure the strength and fire which rude passionate men bring into society quite clear of their vices but who dares draw out the linchpin from the wagon wheel tis so manifest that there is no moral deformity but is a good passion out of place that there is no man who is not indebted to his foibles that according to the old oracle quote, the furies are the bonds of men end quote. that the poisons are our principal medicines which kill the disease and save the life in the high prophetic phrase he causes the wrath of men to praise him and twists and wrenches our evil to our good shakespeare wrote quote, tis said best men are moulded of their faults end quote. and great educators and lawgivers and especially generals and leaders of colonies mainly rely on this stuff and esteem men of irregular and passional force the best timber a man of sense and energy the late head of the farm school in boston harbour said to me quote, i want none of your good boys give me the bad ones End quote. and this is the reason i suppose why as soon as the children are good the mothers are scared and think they are going to die mirabeau said quote, there are none but men of strong passions capable of going to greatness none but such capable of meriting the public gratitude End quote. passion though a bad regulator is a powerful spring any absorbing passion has the effect to deliver from the little coils and cares of every day tis the heat which sets our human atoms spinning overcomes the friction of crossing thresholds and first addresses in society and gives us a good start and speed easy to continue when once it is begun in short there is no man who is not at some time indebted to his vices as no plant that is not fed for manures we only insist that the man meliorate and that the plant grow upward and convert the base into the better nature the wise workman will not regret the poverty or the solitude which brought out his working talents the youth is charmed with the fine air and accomplishments of the children of fortune but all great men come out of the middle classes tis better for the head tis better for the heart marcus antoninus says that fronto told him quote, that the so-called high-born are for the most part heartless end quote. whilst nothing is so indicative of deepest culture as a tender consideration of the ignorant charles james fox said of england quote, the history of this country proves that we are not to expect from men in affluent circumstances the vigilance energy and exertion 
without which the House of Commons would lose its greatest force and weight. Human nature is prone to indulgence, and the most meritorious public services have always been performed by persons in a condition of life removed from opulence. End quote. And yet what we ask daily is to be conventional. Supply, most kind gods, this defect in my address, in my form, in my fortunes, which puts me a little out of the ring. Supply it, and let me be like the rest whom I admire, and on good terms with them. But the wise gods say, No, we have better things for thee. By humiliations, by defeats, by loss of sympathy, by gulfs of disparity, learn a wider truth and humanity than that of a fine gentleman. A Fifth Avenue landlord, a West End householder, is not the highest style of man. And though good hearts and sound minds are of no condition, yet he who is to be wise for many must not be protected. He must know the huts where poor men lie, and the chores which poor men do. The first-class minds, Aesop, Socrates, Cervantes, Shakespeare, Franklin, had the poor man's feeling and mortification. A rich man was never insulted in his life, but this man must be stung. A rich man was never in danger from cold, or hunger, or war, or ruffians, and you can see he was not from the moderation of his ideas. It is a fatal disadvantage to be cockered, and to eat too much cake. What tests of manhood could he stand? Take him out of his protections. He is a good bookkeeper, or he is a shrewd adviser in the insurance office. Perhaps he could pass a college examination and take his degrees. Perhaps he can give wise counsel in a court of law. Now plant him down among farmers, firemen, Indians and emigrants. Set a dog on him. Set a highwayman on him. Try him with a cause of mobs. Send him to Kansas, to Pike's Peak, to Oregon. And, if he have true faculty, this may be the element he wants, and he will come out of it with broader wisdom a manly power. Aesop, Sadie, Cervantes, Regnard, have been taken by corsairs, left for dead, sold for slaves, and know the realities of human life. Bad times have a scientific value. These are occasions a good learner would not miss, as we go gladly to Fennel Hall to be played upon by the stormy winds and strong fingers of enraged patriotism so is a fanatical persecution, civil war, national bankruptcy, or revolution, more rich in the central tones than languid years of prosperity. What had been, ever since our memory, solid continent, yawns apart and discloses its composition and genesis. We learn geology the morning after the earthquake, on ghastly diagrams of cloven mountains, upheaved plains, and the dry bed of the sea. In our life and culture, everything is worked up and comes in use. Passion, war, revolt, bankruptcy, and not less, folly and blunders, insult, ennui, and bad company. Nature is a rag merchant who works up every shred and ought and end into new creations, like a good chemist whom I found the other day in his laboratory converting his old shirts into pure white sugar. Life is a boundless privilege, and when you pay for your ticket and get into the car, you have no guess what good company you shall find there. You buy much that is not rendered in the bill. Men achieve a certain greatness unawares when working to another aim. If now in this connection of discourse we should venture on laying down the first obvious rules of life, I will not here repeat the first rule of economy, already propounded once and again, that every man shall maintain himself. But I will say, get health. No labor, pains, temperance, poverty, nor exercise that can gain it must be grudged. For sickness is a cannibal which eats up all the life and youth it can lay hold of, and absorbs its own sons and daughters. I figure it as a pale, wailing, distracted phantom, absolutely selfish, heedless of what is good and great, attentive to its sensations, losing its soul, and afflicting other souls with meanness and mopings, and with ministration to its veracity of trifles. Dr. Johnson said severely, quote, 
every man is a rascal as soon as he's sick end quote. drop the cant and treat it sanely in dealing with the drunken we do not affect to be drunk we must treat the sick with the same firmness giving them of course every aid but withholding ourselves i once asked a clergyman in a retired town who were his companions what men of ability he saw he replied that he spent his time with the sick and the dying i said he seemed to me to need quite other company and all the more that he had this for if people were sick and dying to any purpose we would leave all and go to them but as far as i had observed they were as frivolous as the rest and sometimes much more frivolous let us engage our companions not to spare us i knew a wise woman who said to her friends quote, when i am old rule me end quote. and the best part of health is fine disposition it is more essential than talent even in the works of talent nothing will supply the want of sunshine to peaches and to make knowledge valuable you must have the cheerfulness of wisdom whenever you are sincerely pleased you are nourished the joy of the spirit indicates its strength all healthy things are sweet-tempered genius works in sport and goodness smiles to the last and for the reason that whoever sees the law which distributes things does not despond but is animated to great desires and endeavours he who desponds betrays that he has not seen it tis a dutch proverb that quote, pain costs nothing end quote. such are its preserving qualities in damp climates well sunshine costs less yet is finer pigment and so of cheerfulness or a good temper the more it is spent the more of it remains the latent heat of an ounce of wood or stone is inexhaustible you may rub the same chip of pine to the point of kindling a hundred times and the power of happiness of any soul is not to be computed or drained it is observed that a depression of spirits develops the germs of a plague in individuals and nations it is an old commendation of right behaviour aliis letus sapiens sibi which our english proverb translates be merry and wise i know how easy it is to men of the world to look grave and sneer at your sanguine youth and its glittering dreams but i find the gayest castles in the air that were ever piled far better for comfort and for use than the dungeons in the air that are daily dug and caverned out by grumbling discontented people i know those miserable fellows and i hate them who see a black star always riding through the light and coloured clouds in the sky overhead waves of light pass over and hide it for a moment but the black star keeps fast in the zenith but power dwells with cheerfulness hope puts us in a working mood whilst despair is no muse and untunes the active powers a man should make life and nature happier to us or he'd better never been born when the political economist reckons up the unproductive classes he should put at the head this class of pitiers of themselves cravers of sympathy bewailing imaginary disasters an old french verse runs in my translation some of your griefs you have cured and the sharpest you still have survived but what torments of pain you endured from evils that never arrived there are three wants which never can be satisfied that of the rich who wants something more that of the sick who wants something different and that of the traveller who says anywhere but here the turkish cadi said to layard quote, after the fashion of thy people thou hast wandered from one place to another until thou art happy and content in none End quote. my countrymen are not less infatuated with the rococo toy of italy all america seems on the point of embarking for europe but we shall not always traverse seas and lands with light purposes and for pleasure as we say one day we shall cast out the passion for europe by the passion for america culture will give gravity and domestic rest to those who now travel only as not knowing how else to spend money already who provoke pity like that excellent family party just arriving in their well-appointed carriage as far from home and any honest end as ever each nation has asked successively what are they here for until at last the party are shamefaced 
and anticipate the question at the gates of each town. Genial manners are good, and power of accommodation to any circumstance, but the high price of life, the crowning fortune of a man, is to be born with a bias to some pursuit, which finds him in employment and happiness, whether it be to make baskets, or broadswords, or canals, or statutes, or songs. I doubt not this was the meaning of Socrates when he pronounced artists the only truly wise as being actually not apparently so. In childhood we fancied ourselves walled in by the horizon as by a glass bell, and doubted not by distant travel we should reach the baths of the descending sun and stars. On experiment the horizon flies before us and leaves us on an endless common, sheltered by no glass bell. Yet it is strange how tenaciously we cling to that bell astronomy of a protecting domestic horizon. I find the same illusion in the search after happiness, which I observe every summer recommenced in this neighbourhood soon after the pairing of the birds. The young people do not like the town, do not like the seashore. They will go inland, find a dear cottage deep in the mountains, secret as their hearts. They set forth on their travels in search of a home. They reach Berkshire, they reach Vermont, they look at the farms, good farms, high mountain sides, but where is the seclusion? The farm is near this, tis near that, they have got far from Boston, but tis near Albany, or near Burlington, or near Montreal. They explore a farm, but the house is small, old, thin, discontented people live there and are gone. There is too much sky, too much outdoors, too public. The youth aches for solitude. When he comes to the house, he passes through the house. That does not make the deep recess he sought. Ah, now I perceive, he says, it must be deep with persons. Friends only can give death. Yes, but there is a great dearth this year of friends, hard to find and hard to have when found. They are just going away. They too are in the whirl of the flitting world and have engagements and necessities. They are just starting for Wisconsin, have letters from Bremen. See you again soon. Slow, slow to learn the lesson that there is but one death, but one interior, and that is his purpose. When joy or calamity or genius shall show him it, then woods, then farms, then city shopmen and cab drivers, indifferently with profit or friend, will mirror back to him its unfathomable heaven, its populous solitude. The uses of travel are occasional and short, but the best fruit it finds, when it finds it, is conversation, and this is a main function of life. What a difference in the hospitality of minds! Inestimable is he to whom we can say what we cannot say to ourselves. Others are involuntarily hurtful to us, and bereave us of the power of thought, impound and imprison us. As, when there is sympathy, there needs but one wise man in a company, and all are wise. So a blockhead makes a blockhead of his companion. Wonderful power to be numb possesses this brother. When he comes into the office or public room, the society dissolves. One after another slips out, and the apartment is at his disposal. What is incurable but a frivolous habit? A fly is as untamable as a hyena. Yet folly in the sense of fun, fooling or dawdling, can easily be borne. As Tyrant said, quote, I find nonsense singularly refreshing, end quote. But a virulent, aggressive fool taints the reason of a household. I have seen a whole family of quiet, sensible people, unhinged and beside themselves, victims of such a rogue for the steady wrong-headedness of one perverse person irritates the best, since we must withstand absurdity. But resistance only exasperates the acrid fool, who believes that nature and gravitation are quite wrong, and he only is right. Hence all the dozen inmates are soon perverted, with whatever virtues and industries they have, into contradictors, accusers, explainers, and repairers of this one malefactor, like a boat about to be overset, or a carriage run away with. Not only the foolish pilot or driver, but everybody on board is forced to assume strange and ridiculous attitudes, to balance the vehicle and prevent the upsetting. For remedy, whilst the case is yet mild, 
I recommend phlegm and truth. Let all the truth that is spoken or done be at the zero of indifferency, or truth itself will be folly. But when the case is seated and malignant, the only safety is in amputation. As seamen say, you shall cut and run. How to live with unfit companions? For, with such, life is for the most part spent. And experience teaches little better than our earliest instinct of self-defense, namely, not to engage, not to mix yourself in any manner with them, but let their madness spend itself unopposed. You are you, and I am I. Conversation is an art in which a man has all mankind for his competitors, for it is that which all are practicing every day while they live. Our habit of thought, take men as they rise, is not satisfying. In the common experience, I fear, it is poor and squalid. The success which will content them is a bargain, a lucrative employment, an advantage gained over a competitor, a marriage, a patrimony, a legacy, and the like. With these objects, their conversation deals with services, politics, trade, personal defects, exaggerated bad news, and the rain. This is forlorn, and they feel sore and sensitive. Now, if one comes who can illuminate this dark house with thoughts, show them their native riches, what gifts they have, how indispensable each is, what magical powers over nature and men, what access to poetry, religion, and the powers which constitute character, he wakes in them the feeling of worth. His suggestions require new ways of living, new books, new men, new arts and sciences. Then we come out of our eggshell existence into the great dome, and see the zenith over and the nadir under us. Instead of the tanks and buckets of knowledge to which we are daily confined, we come down to the shore of the sea and dip our hands in its miraculous waves. It is wonderful the effect on the company. They are not the men they were. They have all been to California, and all have come back millionaires. There is no book and no pleasure in life comparable to it. Ask what is best in our experience, and we shall say, a few pieces of plain dealing with wise people. Our conversation once and again has apprised us that we belong to better circles than we have yet beheld, that a mental power invites us, whose generalizations are more worth for joy and for effect than anything that is now called philosophy or literature. In excited conversation we have glimpses of the universe, hints of power native to the soul, far-darting lights and shadows of an Andes landscape such as we can hardly attain in lone meditation. Here are oracles sometimes profusely given, to which the memory goes back in barren hours. Add the consent of will and temperament, and there exists the covenant of friendship. Our chief want in life is somebody who shall make us do what we can. This is the service of a friend. With him we are easily great. There is a sublime attraction in him to whatever virtue is in us. How he flings wide the doors of existence! What questions we ask of him! What an understanding we have! How few words are needed! It is the only real society. An Eastern poet, Ali ben Abu Talib, writes with sad truth, quote, He who has a thousand friends has not a friend to spare, and he who has one enemy shall meet him everywhere. End quote. But few writers have said anything better to this point than Hafiz, who indicates this relation as the test of mental health. Quote, thou learnest no secret until thou knowest friendship, since to the unsound no heavenly knowledge enters. End quote. Neither is life long enough for friendship. That is a serious and majestic affair, like a royal presence or a religion, and not a postillion's dinner to be eaten on the run. There is a pudency about friendship as about love, and though fine souls never lose sight of it, yet they do not name it. With the first class of men our friendship or good understanding goes quite behind all accidents of estrangement, of condition, of reputation. And yet we do not provide for the greatest good of life. We take care of our health, we lay up money, we make our roof tight and our clothing sufficient, but who provides wisely that he shall not be wanting in the best property of all? Friends. 
we know that all our training is to fit us for this and we do not take the step towards it how long shall we sit and wait for these benefactors it makes no difference in looking back five years how you have been dieted or dressed whether you have been lodged on the first floor or the attic whether you have had gardens and baths good cattle and horses have been carried in a neat equipage or in a ridiculous truck these things are forgotten so quickly and leave no effect but it counts much whether we have had good companions in that time almost as much as what we have been doing and see the overpowering importance of neighbourhood in all association as it is marriage fit or unfit that makes our home so it is who lives near us of equal social degree a few people at convenient distance no matter how bad company these and these only shall be your life's companions and all those who are native congenial and by many an oath of the heart sacramented to you are gradually and totally lost you cannot deal systematically with this fine element of society and one may take a good deal of pains to bring people together and to organize clubs and debating societies and yet no result come of it but it is certain that there is a great deal of good in us that does not know itself and that a habit of union and competition brings people up and keeps them up to their highest point that life would be twice or ten times life if spent with wise and fruitful companions the obvious inference is a little useful deliberation and preconcert when one goes to buy house and land but we live with people on other platforms we live with dependents not only with the young whom we are to teach all we know and clothe with the advantages we have earned but also with those who serve us directly and for money yet the old rules hold good let not the tie be mercenary though the service is measured by money make yourself necessary to somebody do not make life hard to any this point is acquiring new importance in american social life our domestic service is usually a foolish fracas of unreasonable demand on one side and shirking on the other a man of wit was asked in the train what was his errand in the city he replied i have been sent to procure an angel to do cooking a lady complained to me that of her two maidens one was absent-minded and the other was absent-bodied and the evil increases from the ignorance and hostility of every shipload of the immigrant population swarming into houses and farms few people discern that it rests with the master or the mistress what service comes from the man or the maid that this identical hussy was a tutelar spirit in one house and a harridan in the other all sensible people are selfish and nature is tugging at every contract to make the terms of it fair if you are proposing only your own the other party must deal a little hardly by you if you deal generously the other though selfish and unjust will make an exception in your favour and deal truly with you when i asked an ironmaster about the slag and cinder in railroad iron oh he said there's always good iron to be had if there's cinder in the iron tis because there was cinder in the pay but why multiply these topics and their illustrations which are endless life brings to each his task and whatever art you select algebra planting architecture poems commerce politics all are attainable even to the miraculous triumphs on the same terms of selecting that for which you are apt begin at the beginning proceed in order step by step tis as easy to twist iron anchors and braid cannons as to braid straw to boil granite as to boil water if you take all the steps in order wherever there is failure there is some giddiness some superstition about luck some step omitted which nature never pardons the happy conditions of life may be had on the same terms their attraction for you is the pledge that they are within your reach our prayers are prophets there must be fidelity and there must be adherence how respectable the life that clings to its objects youthful aspirations are fine things your theories and plans of life are fair and commendable but will you stick not one i fear in that common full of people 
or in a thousand but one. And when you tax them with treachery, and remind them of their high resolutions, they have forgotten that they made a vow. The individuals are fugitive, and in the act of becoming something else, and irresponsible. The race is great, the ideal fair, but the men whiffling and unsure. The hero is he who is immovably centred. The main difference between people seems to be that one man can come under obligations on which you can rely, is obligeable, and another is not. As he has not a law within him, there is nothing to tie him to. It is inevitable to name particulars of virtue and of condition and to exaggerate them, but all rests at last on that integrity which dwarfs talent and can spare it. Sanity consists in not being subdued by your means. Fancy prices are paid for position and for the culture of talent, but to the grand interests, superficial success is of no account. The man, it is his attitude, not feats but forces, not on set days and public occasions, but at all hours, and in repose alike as in energy, still formidable and not to be disposed of. The populace says, with Horn Tuck, quote, If you would be powerful, pretend to be powerful. End quote. I prefer to say, with the old prophet, quote, Seekest thou great things, seek them not. End quote. Or what was said of a Spanish prince, quote, The more you took from him, the greater he looked. End quote. Plus on lui haute, plus il est grand. The secret of culture is to learn that a few great points steadily reappear, alike in the poverty of the obscurest farm and in the miscellany of metropolitan life, and that these few are alone to be regarded, the escape from all false ties, courage to be what we are, and love of what is simple and beautiful. Independence and cheerful relation, these are the essentials, these and the wish to serve to add somewhat to the well-being of men. End of Essay 7 Considerations